Hello everyone, Jamie here. Hello. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning all. Hello, Agnieszka. Hi. Hi. I seem to have received a message that perhaps my uh... Uh, dear Mrs. Deputy Minister Ivanova, dear lecturers, dear guests, I am pleased to welcome you to today's meeting on the International Space Cooperation for Safe and Sustainable World. This is the third consecutive event organized by Ministry of Economy, the Office of Technology Transfer, Risk Space Transfer of Bulgarian Academy of Science and Sofia Tech Park dedicated to space. 
The main goal of these information sessions is to raise the awareness of the Bulgarian community of experts and specialists from the state administration, industry, scientific and public organization about the latest achievement in the field, in the field of space at European and global level. Thus helping to identify national priorities for the development of the space sector in Bulgaria. Today, we will have the pleasure to hear the senior experts, representatives of one of the leaders in the space sector, the United States of America. With the launch a month ago of the managed spacecraft Dragon from the company SpaceX, a new beginning was set in the space business. Experts and analysis are yet to assess the impact of these projects for the future development of the space industry and business, and their contribution to the all spheres of public life. Finally, in order not to look like Hollywood, I would like to thank all those who made great efforts to hold this first Bulgarian-American meeting of the specialists in the space sector which I hope will set a new beginning of the, for the development of bilateral cooperation in the field of space between Bulgaria and the United States of America. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Nathaniel Stefanov, Vice President of the Management Board, Vice Chairman of Management Board of Sofia Tech Park, uh, who is our host, and he will moderate our session today. Nathaniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carmen. Before I proceed, because I know that the people in the stream are hearing us, but I want just to make sure that everyone on Zoom also here as well. Could I have your side that you're hearing as well? Thanks a lot. So, so once, again, once again, hello everyone, especially to the people uh, in our stream today. We have gathered people like from the dream team of aerospace industry uh, from, from the US, so it's a really great honor for, for all of us to be here. So before we start, I'd like to give the welcoming floor to Mrs. Uh, Lilia Ivanova, who is the Deputy Minister of Economy in Bulgaria and the Bulgarian representative in the European Space Agency. So Mrs. Ivanova, welcome. I just think you should unmute yourself. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you very well. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm pleased to open the, today's uh, working session dedicated to international space cooperation for a safe and sustainable world. And to welcome all the representatives of the Bulgarian administration, science and industry, as well as our international guest from the U.S. Embassy, uh, Mr. Miguel Hernandez. It is an honor as well for me to introduce our guests and speakers. Dr. Jamie Morin, Vice President at Aerospace Corporation. Agnieszka Lukaszczyk, Senior Director, European Affairs Planet and Mesut Chichiker, Sales Representative Principal, Europe Lockheed Martin. I hope the pronunciation of the names were correct. <laughs> so, uh, COVID-19 caused turbulences in socioeconomic life, and uh, at the same time, it gave us opportunities. Uh, our life became more digital, uh, and we understood high, uh, how important high tech is uh, for uh, our life. Uh, and speaking uh, of high tech, we cannot uh, miss mentioning advances of space technologies. Today's uh, discussion uh, has uh, its significant meaning in order to highlight key areas in Bulgarian space domain and areas of development and future targets. It is also our role to support SMEs and companies in matching space to user needs in order to strengthen their competitiveness. Ministry of Economy uh, coordinates the space policy at national and European level in Bulgaria. Our ultimate goal is to increase the competitiveness in Bulgarian industry 
and to support involvement of academia by creating favorable environments, encourage innovations, and increase the awareness about space programs. Furthermore, we are aiming to expand our agreement with the European Space Agency and provide higher opportunities to the space domain. Currently, Bulgaria is a country with scientific infrastructure and technical capabilities, and our major strengths are in the fields of space electronics, remote sensing, space weather, space science, and space technology. Therefore, we would like to discuss with all of you topics based on your practices, generating new business ideas in order to focus on future perspectives for the Bulgarian space stakeholders. In conclusion, I would like to wish to all participants today a fruitful discussion and to express our hopes that the meeting could be a beneficial milestone for future perspectives in the Bulgarian space domain. Thank you. I wish you success of the discussions. Thank you, Ms. Ivanova. It is very important that you were able to open our discussion. Now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Miguel Hernandez, who is the senior commercial officer at the American Embassy in Bulgaria. So he's got much experience uh, in the field of commercial diplomacy, and I'm sure that he will have much to share with us today. Miguel? OK, yes. Uh, first, the sound check. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, Miguel. We hear you. OK, great. OK, so first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Minister Lilia Ivanova, for the introduction. And for all of you who are gathered here today, it's an impressive a list of attendees as well as uh, speakers. So first, I will make just three points uh, on education, U.S. Embassy uh, projects on government, government, on the commercial side, and with a cultural point. Okay, so first, at the embassy, we really are, are working with Bulgaria to uh, put the dream of working in space. And I, I'll give you an, some examples on the education side. Because Bulgaria has a history of strong performances in sciences, you know, we support, the embassy supports many STEM education programs, uh, from teaching robotics to children in libraries throughout Bulgaria, to uh, encouraging Bulgarian students to apply to as well as teachers to, to attend space camp in the U.S. And I, I've been in Bulgaria now two years. Every Bulgarian I meet has a bachelor's or master's degrees in the sciences. I, my theory is that each Bulgarian baby is born with a table or a Mendeleev table, and then they can start playing with dolls or toys. Um, so I think they knew that they, they put the science in them early on. Another example, last year we brought NASA astronaut Richard Lineman to Bulgaria, again to meet with an actual astronaut who flew aboard Space Shuttle Columbia and flew above uh, on Space Shuttle Endeavour. We did a program for him where it's a little known fact, but Bulgaria is one of the biggest manufacturers of space food, and they currently uh, support uh, space programs throughout the world. Um, I have a theory for the long life of Bulgarians. If you eat uh, the Bulgarian yogurt, lactose basilicas bulgaricas, you can live to be 100 year, years old. So MBC, US government projects, we have recently signed an agreement with the Bulgarian government. It was the agreement for space situational awareness, services and data. And this is because uh, uh, a couple of years ago, SpaceX launched a Bulgarian satellite into space, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were would avoid any potential collision or damage. So this is something that we uh, negotiated actually this year. Another example is with the Lockheed Martin F-16 deal. This is a, a deal that brought Bulgaria in, uh, you know, strengthened our NATO, the NATO alliance. And when Lockheed Martin was here, we promoted a program with the STEM sciences where we had students uh, able to do uh, 
uh, special projects in the sciences, as well as, you know, fly the uh, flight simulator. And I know we'll have somebody from Lockheed Martin speaking here uh, later on. So we look forward to hearing from him. Finally, I learned the Bulgarian word for pride, and it's gordost. And I know it was all in the news this, uh, these, um, this, these past few weeks when the SpaceX launch, uh, successful one most recently, had a number of Bulgarians who contributed to it. We had uh, Kiko Donchev, of course, who was the ground operations director and worked um, with uh, SpaceX for a number of years. There are other Bulgarian scientists involved, uh, such as uh, Alexander Rangelov, as and and um, and a uh, Margarita Marinova, who was an aeronautic engineer, and and so just wanted to sh uh, to underscore that there's a lot of talent here. Finally, I'll end with a cultural point. Uh, before coming to Bulgaria, I attended an event at the Bulgarian Embassy in Washington D.C. I learned that there's a famous singer, Valia Vladinova Bolkanska. She's the soul of the Rodopi Mountains. She actually recorded a song, a Bulgarian folk song, that is on the Voyager probe traveling 35,000 miles per hour in outer space. And if there are aliens out there, Bulgarian may be one of the first languages that they will hear. So with that, I'll end and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. You just made a wonderful overview of the Bulgarian space experience so far and, and the potential. And I think this is a very good starting point, especially for our guests who have no idea, most probably, of what the space industry is in Bulgaria and how it is going. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Jamie Morin, uh, who has got really many titles, so I wouldn't uh, spend some time on sharing because it's what is more important is his uh, input in our discussion. Dr. Morin, it's really an honor. I don't know if you hear us. Hello, can you hear me well now? Yes, well, we can. Hello. Well, hello, everyone. It is wonderful to have an opportunity to join you and be a part of this conference. Uh, thank you for Mr. Hernandez's uh, welcoming remarks from my nation's embassy there and to all of the organizers that have put this event together. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you and to talk a little bit about the importance of strategy in space. Uh, I had some presentational materials that were unfortunately uh, swallowed up through technical difficulties crossing the Atlantic. So what I would like to do is I'll, um, we'll work through those difficulties. I'll provide them to the organizers after the fact and uh, certainly encourage them to post them so that anyone who would like to uh, review them can look at them after the fact. But I'd be... Excuse me for interrupting. I believe you can share your screen. Yeah. Zoom and in this way we'll all be able to see the presentation. Yeah, I'm afraid that's not going to work on my end. The uh, transferring it okay. between machines here is a, a challenge for that. So the... But it, it is not essential to the to what I'm going to talk about today and I'll uh, I'll look forward to uh, talking through it in perhaps more detail privately as well. I wanted to start by discussing with the uh, audience here a little bit about the value of space. Uh, those of us that attend events like this are here in part because we're convinced of that uh, but that is not always an assumption that officials of government have, or that the populace at large in a democracy has. And so for those who are seeking to make a case for a coherent national space policy, for investment at the national level in space, for attraction of the top academic and talent and experts to space, um, it's sometimes helpful to back up and to lay out exactly how space affects human life and the ways in which it makes a difference for us. There's a, my uh, center published a, an extensive report on this just a, a couple of months ago, which I would commend to you if uh, you visit uh, aerospace.org slash policy, you'll find a, a study there on the value of space that has a great deal of uh, explanatory material. But let me delve into just one of the case studies that we worked in the course of that 
uh, study, which is on the agriculture sector. And in the agriculture sector, you see the intersection of multiple space capabilities coming together to increase productivity and efficiency. Uh, the phenomenon of modern precision agriculture certainly critical to the United States economy. It's increasingly important in the uh, Bulgarian economy, particularly in larger area, but it relies heavily on navigation satellites, providing precise positioning information to individual tractors and elements of farm machinery. It, it, re it relies increasingly on data from earth observation satellites, which can help to identify things like soil moisture levels and even the uh, energy content of crops, uh, measuring how successful they've been in growing and nourishing. For the United States, there was a study done that identified the potential consequences of an outage of the uh, U.S. global positioning system for just 30 days. And it suggested that in the agriculture sector alone, the damage would be on the order of 15 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, and that's because the farm sector has invested heavily in exploiting space technology and would find it difficult to go back. That's one of many. The report gets into the fisheries sector and uh, construction and many other industries. We should not forget that we can't take people's appreciation for the importance of the space sector and space systems for granted. It needs to be uh, focused on the educational component of that. And uh, that's part of why I appreciated Mr. Hernandez's remarks about the scientific and technical foundations of uh, in the Bulgarian educational system and the enthusiasm uh, that he sees all the time there. So once we've made that sales pitch, once we've explained that issue, then the question in developing strategy comes to one of identifying goals and policies and building plans to achieve them. But as we all know, I think from both our personal and professional lives, uh, goals and plans are at their best when they're focused on reasonable and achievable objectives. So what I'd like to talk about next is how to define reasonable and achievable objectives in the space sector. And I'll ask everyone in the audience to just take a moment and envision uh, a simple Venn diagram. Um, the, you know, this is the concept where we create circles or shapes which represent a, uh, a set and the intersection between those sets is often depicted as an overlap. Um, so think of this concept of a Venn diagram, think of a three part diagram here and think of the first circle in this diagram representing those things which are technologically feasible in space. Space is an engineered domain. Humanity doesn't really exist there. It's a hard place to exist. So there's many things we can dream of that it, at least today may not be technologically feasible. Those would fall outside the circle of technological feasibility. But each day we're making technological progress and we are as nations, as societies, as businesses, choosing where to put our investment and where to make that progress. So that circle of technological feasibility over time is growing and extending in directions based on human choice. But space isn't merely a technological domain. It's also a domain where the economics matter. So envision a second and that circle is the domain of what is economically viable, the set of what is economically viable. And economic viability in space has changed over time. We have, uh, we've moved from a space economy where the 
overwhelming preponderance of activity is directed by governments to one in which governments are still a very significant player, but a great deal of the energy is caught up in a more democratized domain where individual businesses and um, individual investors are significant players. So that that uh, circle in your Venn diagram of economically viable activity is growing and it's reshaping itself. But both neither technology nor economics alone is sufficient for success in space. The other piece is activities undertaken in space under the terms of the Outer Space Treaty and other international agreements, now increasingly customary international law, occur subject to the licensing and approval and consent of host governments. And host governments must identify their policy restrictions for what sort of activity is permissible in space. Uh, for many years, governments allowed private activity in space if it was compatible with national security interests. They're increasingly uh, expanding the kind of activity that's permitted by their companies and universities and other <laughs> players. And they are also adding some new considerations. You're increasingly seeing heavy consideration to space sustainability. Don't launch things into space that are likely to worsen the growing debris problem, for example, or further complicate the, the electromagnetic spectrum allocation problem. So the domain of what is policy acceptable is also changing and morphing over time. What we can actually accomplish in space is represented only by the intersection of those three circles that you're envisioning, the policy acceptable, the economically viable, and the technologically feasible. I think the best way to conceive of national space policy, um, the national space policy terrain today, is to think about how and in which directions the nation is going to seek to expand the intersection of those three sets the policy acceptable, the economically viable, the technologically feasible. I think that is a critical question facing a nation like Bulgaria as you look to grow and expand your space economy. There's another set of choices that are important to make in this regard. Um, space capabilities, even though they are increasingly democratized, are still expensive. They still take significant time, intellectual energy, and money to deliver. So for a nation which, like any nation in the world, does not have an unlimited economy or an unlimited pool of technical talent, it's important to think about what capabilities it's essential for the nation to fundamentally control. What are the sovereign capabilities that a nation wishes to have access to? On, on top of those, where are the capabilities where a nation comfortable sharing with other countries and organizations. Uh, Bulgaria obviously currently forward toward European Space Agency full participation. As a participant in the NATO Alliance and as a member of uh, space situational awareness data sharing agreements, there are, there are many capabilities where at a national level, Bulgaria and many other nations have made decisions that they will rely upon others or be in a shared control environment where a third area is what are those capabilities where we're, you would only be comfortable, I'm uh, sorry, where you would be comfortable even if those capabilities were controlled by completely outside organizations or countries or the private sector and uh, the nation did not have even any significant role in shaping us, where they would in essence buy it as a service or partake in an international public good. I think thinking through those kinds of questions helps to focus and uh, uh, what are the ultimate objectives of formulating a strategy. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has continued to grapple with these kinds of questions uh, under uh, President Obama. A space uh, strategy was published uh, just less than 10 years ago, and the United States has moved forward to update that under the current administration. Um, with several uh, significant additional policy directives. I would say that across the um, recent history, it's been 
clear in all these directives and all these strategy documents that securing the scientific, the commercial, the security benefits from space is a clear national priority. There's also a clear and strong thread in these strategy documents about cooperation across sectors, cooperation across the national security sector, commercial industry, the civil, scientific, and exploration sector, uh, and international cooperation as well. There is a thread that's increasingly strong uh, under the current United States administration to identify that other actors in the international system are making investments and taking decisions uh, that appear to be significantly increasing the threat environment in space, turning it into a war fighting domain is a phrase that's frequently used. Um, invest missiles to shoot down satellites and orbital weapons and jammers and things of this sort. Those are, those are troubling developments and um, the, the current administration has laid out a, you know, plans for response there. Uh, but beyond those points, they continue to identify a strong partnership founded approach that relies on the whole of government that has four critical pillars. One is uh, investment in more resilient architectures, meaning that the capabilities that are placed on orbit are going to be things that we can rely on and our allies and partners can rely on, even in the face of uh, potential negative action by adversaries. Uh, we will work to strengthen deterrence options, work to improve foundational capabilities. And another uh, core area of focus in this current administration is uh, streamlining regulatory frameworks, policies, and processes. There's also new organizational effort to coordinate all of this change, which is uh, what we call our National Space Council, uh, which was which has existed at various times in American history, but had uh, gone dormant and was uh, reactivated three years ago uh, under the leadership of the Vice President of the United States and with a, uh, an executive director appointed, uh, Dr. Scott Pace, who's uh, well known in international space policy circles. Uh, that has served primarily as a coordinating body and an engagement body and I would note there's a few facets of that uh, organization that are worth thinking about uh, in developing national space policy. One is that it has active participation from senior leadership of multiple agencies in cabinet, multiple agencies of the, of the government. In the United States, uh, of course, the NASA gets the bulk of the space publicity as our lead civil and uh, scientific space agency, hugely important. Um, but a large share of the space budget is spent by our Department of Defense and our intelligence community to do things like monitor uh, arms control treaties and compliance with them. The, and the defense community does things like provide the global positioning service, uh, you know, the, the first major global navigation service. The, uh, so there is a great deal of coordination and unity of effort that must be achieved in order to have coherent policy. Uh, that is true in most countries, even if the agencies involved operate at a different scale. And so uh, having coordination at senior levels is very valuable, particularly as the uh, amount of resources being invested grow. Second, the uh, National Space Council as reinvigorated includes what's called a user advisory group. And that includes representatives from a wide variety of uh, private industry and academia and uh, scientific experts. Um, they're arranged in a number of committees and commissions and they are purely advisory, but they do provide an opportunity to raise new topics, new issues, and to bring reports in front of the senior government officials. 
this is valuable at a time when space is changing so rapidly. Uh, there is a fundamental philosophical change underway in the United States in terms of how the government thinks about space. Uh, it's really shifted from an environment where there's been an ins assumption that if government did not do it, it would not happen to a realization that while the government can shape and uh, bend, if you will, the direction of space development, uh, that it is not fundamentally in control or dominating direction. Uh, so that is uh, this inclusion of a user advisory group or stakeholders is I think an important piece of the approach. So let me close with just a couple more observations uh, of what strategic choices the nation of Bulgaria is facing to grapple with issues of space sustainability and national strategy. Um, I would describe space today as being at a critical inflection point. The uh, curve of progress is bending, if you will. Uh, and there's a couple things going on here. First, the cost to enter and to play in the space environment lower, but also the results are more consequential. Um, I talk often about three or four major trends that are driving in the space sector, one of which is this democratization, the lowering of barriers to entry, um, which is enabling many more players. Another trend, though, is the crowding of space. As those barriers to entry have diminished and more players are active and the pace of space launch is growing and we're seeing launches um, release dozens or in some cases over a hundred separate satellites into orbit, we have to be conscious of the sustainability of the orbital environment, uh, both in terms of debris and in terms of electromagnetic spectrum and access to the satellites on orbit. So the inflection point that we're at is one with lower cost, but also more consequential decisions. In a case where uh, resources are limited, rigor is necessary in making decisions about where to place them. Uh, as, uh, as some of you know, I made a good chunk of my career in terms of allocating uh, resources, both uh, as the chief financial officer for the U.S. Air Force and uh, as the head of resource allocation and analysis for the U.S. Department of Defense. And in, in making decisions with scarce resources, it's important to build upon strengths. It's also important to identify the most critical weaknesses, which are barriers to success in broad areas. So critical weaknesses in key enabling areas and to remediate those. Uh, a rigorous and self-critical assessment of where those strengths and weaknesses are is a necessary first step. And I understand that this is uh, something that uh, the government of Bulgaria working in cooperation with the European Space Agency and other partners is already underway on. Uh, in the case of Bulgaria, we've got a rich history in space. I mean, there are not many nations that have placed uh, or had human beings operate in space. It's still a very short list, uh, even to this day, and that's a, a history to be proud of. Uh, it, it appears that you've got growing national enthusiasm surrounding the topic, and that's exciting and empowering. And uh, a strong commitment, I know, to innovation and uh, to technical excellence. All of those things are critical for growth in the space sector. Uh, the rise of, of private sector players in the country in this area is, I think, very positive. I would commend to you the opportunities for serious and deliberate partnership. Obviously, you're already carefully exploring that uh, with the European Space Agency. I know that in the United States, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, it has through their mo most recent release of what they're calling the Artemis Accords, a, is laying out a pathway for collaboration with the United States on the uh, goal of returning to the moon and um, having, the, having uh, that as a 
critical step on a path to further exploration in the solar system, Mars and beyond. So uh, that's certainly something worth seriously exploring. But I do think the, uh, the core here is to find the areas of highest value uh, where Bulgaria can contribute both to national pride and prosperity, but also to human progress. Um, work in space is one of those areas where we really achieve things as a species, as humanity, as, as a globe, as much as we do as an individual nation or as a, uh, a single state or person. Uh, so active participation in the global dialogue and partnership is, I think, a critical component of the strategy. So let me uh, close my comments there. I'm sorry I wasn't able to provide the uh, visuals to go with this, but I hope that I've been able to draw the picture well enough with words uh, that you've followed the core points. And I, I do look forward to continuing the dialogue and answering questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mullen. Uh, your session was very informational. Like I wrote down a whole sheet with uh, comments and questions that probably we could go back to later on. Uh, I'm very happy of hearing your comments because we will have enthusiasm in Bulgaria, but it is really good when it's verified by people, from, like from people with your experience. So we'll go back on what our next steps really should be in general. Uh, first, as different organizations which are working in the field on the one hand, and on the other hand, as from the Bulgarian uh, government in general. And really find this um, equilibrium between the government and the private sector. And we believe that really the U.S. has this very good experience and you've got many good success stories that you could share. So anyhow, we'll go back to this uh, in the Q&A session. And now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Agnieszka Lukaszczyk, who is the Senior Director for European Affairs at Planet. Hi, um, thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to, to speak to you today. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I am going to share uh, my slides very quickly um, so that I can show you. Um, all right. Can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Perfect. Perfect. So again, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, I wish, of course, I was uh, in person in Sofia and I could talk to you uh, there. But obviously, we are in those challenging times where everything is being done virtually. And uh, so this is the next best thing to connect. Um, my name is Agnieszka Łukaszczyk. I'm a senior director uh, for Planet, um, uh, for European Affairs at Planet. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Planet, but also um, how a new space company can really thrive internationally, a young new space company. So um, I'm not sure if many of you have heard of Planet or not. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a background. But uh, the idea we have come up with is that you can't really fix what you cannot see. So it is very important to have an awareness of the world and what is happening in the world regularly so that we can properly act. And for a long time, uh, big Earth observation satellites, uh, which have been doing amazing work, um, but there haven't been enough of them. So the revisit time has been quite uh, long, five, 10 days. So for instance, a satellite will look at, uh, uh, let's say, Sophia, and then only five days later, or six day la days later, would see Sophia again. And as you can imagine, many things can happen within five, six days, um, and many changes can occur. So it's really important that we have an awareness um, of what is happening. But so this is the idea these guys had. You see them here in the garage. Um, there were th three of them particularly are the co-founders of, of Planet, a British guy, American, um, and Australian. And they were working at NASA Ames, uh, working on um, obviously space technology, working on Earth observation. And they figured that they could do things a little bit differently, a little bit quicker, and use a completely different business model that hasn't been yet used. So um, as many of them would, they would get together after work or on weekends in their garage, as you can 
as you very well know, all the big ideas start in the garage. Um, so they would work together and and try to build something. And you can see on um, on the desk there on the right hand side, there's like a little satellite model, and this is actually the the, the actual size of a satellite. So it's tiny. It's uh, 3U, which means it's 30 centimeters by by 10 centimeters. It weighs about five kilograms, um, so uh, less than my cat. <laughs> And um, and they figure that these little guys can really make a difference. Not many people believe them. They thought they were crazy, that these things will not provide a good quality, that they're toys and that they're not gonna work. But these guys decided to go for it anyway. So here is a little bit of a timeline of the company. Um, the company was uh, funded at the very end, in like end of December of 2010. So the company is less than 10 years old. And um, and uh, and we are here today. I'm not gonna go through all these dates. I just wanted to to to, to kind of show you the timeline. Um, all right. And but I wanted to sh let you know kind of how we expanded in Europe. So the company was founded in Silicon Valley. Well, the headquarters are in San Francisco. Uh, we went from three people at the beginning to uh, over 500 now. And in um, two thousand. 2017, I believe, we have acquired Blackbridge, RapidEye, maybe you know. So uh, it was a RapidEye company, then it was called Blackbridge, and um, they had five satellites, five Earth observation satellites that we have acquired. And we have um, started our European headquarters in Berlin and Germany. So uh, the, our kind of, uh, we have over a hundred people working there. So we have a quarter of our workforce working out of uh, the office in Germany. We have 150 people working in Europe. Um, all of our satellites are actually operated out of Berlin. So not many people know that. And we do have now a largest constellation of satellites in the world. And that constellation is operated out of uh, Berlin. Um, so if you ever there would like to visit, uh, please let us know, it's quite cool. It, also in Europe, we um, process the data and, uh, and we have uh, ground stations in various places, including UK, Germany, Norway, Greece, and, and more. And 46% of our satellites are actually, the components of the satellites are sourced in Europe. So our vendors are in Europe. Uh, and of course our CEO is, um, is British. Um, so I don't know if we can still call that Europe or not, but, um, but uh, <laughs> Uh, kind of, um, but the important part is that we work very closely with the Copernicus program. We are a contributing mission to Copernicus. So we do provide data for the emergency service, the land service and security service. Um, and we, uh, you know, we organize Copernicus master competitions. We're very part of, uh, proud to be like part of this European ecosystem. We've been growing here quite a lot and for at ESA we are also third party mission so if you are a researcher um, you can get our data for free through the earthnet program um, uh, through the ESA earthnet program by the way so this is kind of a cool piece of information um, uh, right so but going back to why we did this why we started this company so as I have told you you know these big satellites have been offering a very, very good um, quality of information, but not frequent enough. And so we saw that there was a lack of insight to what is happening in the world. And therefore that led to lack of action. And of course, uninformed decisions, right? The leaders cannot make good decisions if they do not have a proper situational awareness. And that's kind of to illustrate what I'm saying, right? You're looking at, a, for instance, a, a, the um, airport, you see a plane, and the plane departs and uh, we don't know where it goes. So you do remember the story with the Malaysian plane that disappeared and everybody was like, how could it disappear? Well, because satellites are not looking or, or kind of surveying one object all the time. Um, another uh, example, for instance, for Ill illegal logging, you know, within five days, a lot of trees can be cut. Right, so after five days, a lot of damage can be done. So if you would see it immediately, you could react immediately. Um, so that's why we think um, this kind of uh, constant monitoring is extremely important. And so we came up with this mission. Mission one was to image the entire world every day. 
nobody has done that before. We're like, you know, this is really what's going to give us a proper situational awareness. And this is the baby that I told you about earlier. So that you saw on that desk. So this is our DOV. That satellite is 3.5 meter resolution. And, uh, and we have deployed over 400 of those. Right now, probably about 160 are operational. Um, and that satellite is really a game changer uh, for us and for the world, we believe. So I, um, we are able to manufacture, so we, because we are launching so many satellites, we're able to manufacture 40 satellites per week, which is absolutely crazy because normally it takes years to build one satellite but we kind of, our business model is very different. It's not that we do, by the way, uh, manufacture 40 satellites per week because we don't need that many. But if there is a need, if we need to launch very quickly, we can uh, produce those uh, quite efficiently. And this is what happens. So this is really important to see. So we launched so many of those satellites, they are in sun synchronous orbit. So it's an orbit that goes from, you know, from north to south and those satellites are static. Uh, they're not moving. I mean, they're moving uh, north to south, but we cannot move them left to right. And Earth is obviously moving inside that belt. And it's pretty much like it's going through a scanner. So each satellite takes a strip uh, image, uh, uh, of images and the other one, the Earth turns a little bit. The next one takes another image, another image. So within 24 hours, we're able to uh, image the entire world. And that happens every day. Um, I wanted to show you a launch really quick. This was the biggest launch in history so far. 104 satellites on this launch from India. Those are our satellites, by the way, being just thrown out of the window like garbage. That always scares me when I see that. But that's how launches are done. You think they're very glamorous. They're not. They're just thrown out. Uh, but th there are 104 satellites on that launch. 88 of those were ours. And this is how we made our, our constellation. Um, so just to give you an idea what I've been talking about. So 160 plus are those little guys that are in the middle that I told you about. Five rapid eye satellites are the ones that I told you uh, we have acquired from Germany. We have just retired those guys. They've been working for 12 years or so. So uh, they are uh, being deorbited. And on the right hand side, those are the interesting ones. Um, I actually need to update that slide. We have 18 of those. SkySat satellites, and they're special because they are very high resolution. So they take an image of 50 centimeters. They can take videos um, and you can task them. So what is happening that uh, the very nice combination with the doves, doves are you know monitoring constantly. And then when we have an area of interest, we can send a SkySat, uh, zoom in and take really, really good picture. Those satellites are larger. They're about 150 kilo uh, the size of like a small refrigerator. Um, if you can imagine that. So here's just kind of a types of images that you can see um, that, I mean, we have a lot of, lot of examples, but um, those are the areas that we're working in. Obviously there are many, many other areas. Agriculture is definitely huge for us, uh, but also emergency, energy, uh, forestry, obviously government. So a lot of, lot of areas where we are um, working and providing our data. Here are just some uh, numbers, you know, numbers often speak a lot. So we're taking 1.3 million of pictures, images every day. So uh, that's a lot. And it's really important that this this imagery is used for something useful. So we work with lots of companies around the world that takes that data and actually turns it into information, service, um, application, et cetera. We own uh, 45 ground station antennas around the world. And by the way, what is also different about Planet is that we, we are kind of vertically integrated. We do everything in-house. So most space companies actually specialize in something. So they, for instance, operate satellites, but they procure them from somebody else, or they just manufacture them and sell them. We do everything in-house. So we do the R&D, we manufacture them, we operate them, we process the data. Um, what is also nice with this model, because we launch a lot, so we launch four to six uh, times a, a year, uh, which is a lot. Each time we launch satellites, they're better than the satellites we have launched before. So because we do everything in-house, we can tweak them, we can work on them. 
we can make them better. So we had already 14 iterations of that dog. So that technology that is up there is always um, the top technology that is available available today. Um, and uh, by the way, as you can see, um, a designs on our satellite and some some words. We do work with artists. We are a weird company like that, which is very cool. Uh, we have artists in residence um, who paint our um, our satellite. So we're also launching art into space, by the way. And if you um, and if we uh, like somebody a lot, you can actually put a message on our satellite, then we can launch it to space for you. Yeah. But what's next? So all that data is super, super cool, but it's useless if uh, nothing comes out of it, right? So we, we all know the end users are really interested in solutions and not really data. They don't care where the data is coming from. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with artificial intelligence that can immediately detect certain things on the imagery that the satellites are taking. So they can detect houses, they can detect, uh, detect cars, trees, um, bridges, et cetera, ships. And that is very useful because then you will gonna get answers to questions. For instance, you can ask how many trees have been cut in Southeast Bulgaria between March and May, 2019, and you're gonna get a number immediately. Or how many uh, buildings have been destroyed in this earthquake and you're going to get a number immediately. So this is the type of stuff that we're trying to um, that we're trying to do. Here you get a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, information and kind of to, 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 to get a uh, kind of a situation awareness of what is happening in the Amazon. Um, you know, the forestation is really bad over there and we've been monitoring this and um, and, 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 and it's you know, it is what it is, but uh, it is happening. We should do something about it. Um, well, counting ships, I've already mentioned that. You can also obviously do that with our algorithm that we're using. Um, and what we're also, those are, you know, I just show the news articles because we also give a lot of um, kind of, we believe in what we call transparent planet. So give people awareness about what is happening in the world. So media is often using our imagery because we think that citizens should have access to information. So if something is happening, for instance, in the world and um, some governments are denying that it is happening, well, we often have imagery to prove to the contrary. So when Myanmar was, for instance, denying that they were burning villages, we actually have footage um, of that happening. Here, you know, also uh, the deforestation of Amazon, um, again, you know, uh, Brazilian government was uh, denying that this was happening and we are, well, take a look at this, it is actually happening. So um, it's, it's, it's really, this, this imagery is really giving some um, serious transparency. Uh, but the last thing that I want to talk, talk to you about, and this is kind of strange, but I think very appropriate for the times we're living in, is that technology does not always equal progress because I, I don't know you know who are the viewers now or listeners to this conference but uh but i'm assuming that there are some uh maybe business uh business people people who want to start startups in in, in space and we really strongly believe that uh, there are so many problems in the world if you're going to do something do something that can really help the world a little bit so don't just build technology for sake of technology because it's cool try to find a problem that you can address you know for instance look at sustainable development goals um it has been determined that 13 out of the 17 sustainable goals um can be helped with earth observation one, one way or the other obviously eo is not going to solve everything but it can definitely help so take a look at that and um uh, try to uh, see if you can develop a solution and develop a technology that can really help with that because if not if you're not doing that maybe you should stop working on it you know our planet planet earth um is really in need of, of help you know we have a lot of climate change issues biodiversity issues a lot of issues a pandemic etc so try to think of technology that can really help because you can, do not have to choose anymore between commercial or um humanitarian you can do both you can have a viable business um and and at the same time make a positive impact um, on the world. So I would like to leave you with that and to, to kind of, you know, think of, of, of technology as a tool for um, betterment for humanity. And, uh, and I think if we, if we have that mindset, we can really make a big change. Thank you very much.
this is um, this is it from me, and I'm obviously happy to take questions. I don't know if it's now or later, but uh, uh, but that closes my um, closes my presentation. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. The questions will be at the end of our session. Okay. But what you just shared is quite impressive. Uh, it, you showed in a very good way how you could start with the problem and then create the solution, which is really the entrepreneurial uh, approach on, on doing high value uh, product companies. Uh, probably it's, it's good to share that we have a very interesting uh, company from Bulgaria called Endurosat. They're creating nano satellites. So this may be also something else to, to talk later on uh, because we really also have some uh, first steps in, in this direction. And how we can talk about this later. Now, I'd like to give the floor to our final speaker today, uh, Mr. Mesut Chichikar, who's working for Lockheed Martin. He is the main sales representative for Europe. Mesut, can we hear each other? I don't know if, if Mesut is online. Could we see? I don't hear Mesut. Yes, uh, I do hear you well. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, unfortunately, the light conditions in my office doesn't allow me to uh, show my face to you. Uh, but I think uh, what is important is what I say more than my, uh, my uh, look, I guess. Yes, it's totally okay and we hear you very well. Excellent, excellent. I think I provided uh, the presentation material to Katya. And uh, if, yes, if she can please uh, start it, uh, that would be great. Yes, hold on a sec. I close my, I close my uh, drapes. Uh, the windows are behind me and uh, so that's why I think you don't see me. Uh, it's okay, now we're going to look at the presentation. So excellent. This is what, what is more important. Excellent. Well, please uh, proceed with the with the next chart. Well, L Lockheed Martin is a, a U.S. based company. Uh, it is uh, headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland, U.S., and uh, it's a global security and aerospace company. Uh, it has uh, four major line of business: uh, aeronautics. Uh, division uh, manufactures uh, the platforms, flying platforms like fighter jets and transportation planes and provide also the sustainment operations around the world. Uh, missiles and fire control, it's another line of business. Uh, well, I think you can understand from the, 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 the title. It is uh, <clears throat> core business. It's in missiles and uh, precision uh, fire controls. Uh, rotary and mission uh, systems, uh, we <clears throat> recently uh, acquired uh, Skorsky uh, from Poland and uh, uh, we manufacture uh, rotary wing platforms and also mission systems has a number of naval products uh, and also uh, radar systems are in this group. Uh, the space systems, it is uh, one of the fourth and also equally important uh, line of business of Lockheed Martin Corporation. And uh, it has a number of good capabilities uh, providing to uh, US government, allied nations, and also to commercial satellite operators. Uh, next chart, please. Well, uh, our customers are, uh, our number one customers is U.S. government and uh, uh, U.S. Uh, governmental institutions, uh, armed forces, uh, Air Force, uh, uh, number one customer of Lockheed Martin Space uh, Company. Uh, we, as I said, we also provided a lot of commercial platforms for commercial satellite operators. Uh, uh, we have close relationships with UK MOD and uh, also uh, there are a number of uh, classified special programs that uh, uh, we uh, we kind of uh, execute and deliver to US government. 
Uh, I think there are a few uh, companies that I'd like to also say that, you know, we have ownership or joint ventures uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the chart. Uh, one of the important ones is the EULA, United Launch Alliance, that we have with Boeing. We provide uh, Atlas and uh, uh, Delta launch vehicle uh, uh, services to uh, U.S. government and also the, the commercial satellite uh, operators. Uh, well, uh, there is uh, one area that uh, I'd like to uh, indicate as the, the previous uh, speaker, uh, I think, Miss uh, Lukasik, if I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, the Mission Solutions Group, uh, uh, as uh, Mrs. Lukasik indicated, yes, we manufacture this uh, very uh, capable platforms and we launch them. And then, but what they do for us uh, is what what is important, uh, the data that we receive them, but how we uh, integrate and how we process this data and provide the end users in a very usable format which uh, it is the key and mission solutions group is is doing that with their software hardware and ground segments uh, they make uh, all the uh, platforms that we launch into space uh, either uh, in the low earth orbit medium earth orbit uh, geosynchronous orbit or uh, deep space exploration programs uh, they uh, kind of uh, receive and process the data and make it uh, uh, user friendly, which it can be looked at, and then some decisions could be taken. Uh, Lockheed Martin Space uh, Company goes almost like little more than 50 years uh, in in space domain, and the first geosynchronous satellite that uh, that we manufactured in uh, early 70s for uh, uh, RCA SATCOM, which was the SATCOM-1 satellite. And uh, we uh, were uh, the, the founder of the three-axis stabilized uh, uh, spacecraft, uh, which then many of the other companies uh, uh, from spinner to uh, three-axis based satellites, they transformed over the years. Uh, the next uh, chart, please. Well, uh, this chart is a little bit of a marketing uh, chart, but I wanted to use it just to give you an idea. Uh, over this uh, 50 years time period, uh, 945 over almost like close to 1000 today, because the chart is few months old, uh, the platforms uh, manufactured, built and, and launched. Uh, mission success is very important for, for Lockheed Martin, as all the other uh, space companies. Uh, uh, with the exception of very few platforms that uh, following the, the launch uh, uh, step, launch event, uh, very few of them, we had a chance to, to fix it because of their position and where they are and how it can be, uh, tree, how it can be uh, repaired. Uh, uh, one of them was like Hubble telescope, for example. But uh, most of the platforms after it's launched, it is uh, not reachable or it is impossible to repair them, to fix them. So uh, those platforms, uh, also I go back to my uh, design integration and test uh, uh, days uh, in my earlier years of my career in US. Uh, we subject these platforms so much test and environmental conditions. We uh, force them to see how they respond. And I, I believe when they launch and separated from a launch vehicle, they, <laughs> uh, they say, oh, thank God. Now I'm through this. Now I can, I can live and, and function and operate in a, in a very, uh, in better, better conditions. So we, we test them very heavily. Emission success is very important. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that, you know, uh, overall, we have uh, a kind of a very impressive factor of uh, 
little over 99% of emission success. Uh, and one thing also to indicate, uh, because of our uh, different line of business and expertise, uh, out of this uh, little over 18,000 people, uh, the majority of them, more than 50 or 60% are uh, scientists uh, with uh, uh, doctorate and, and master degree. Uh, uh, the, the science is uh, very important in Lockheed Martin culture. And uh, uh, every single uh, Mars mission that Lockheed Martin has either played a prime or sub role. So we have a contribution to uh, Mars missions, uh, not to mention number of uh, deep space exploration that, uh, that the company is involved. The next chart, please. And the, the next one, please. Uh, just one before, please. Uh, yeah, this is a, our uh, famous LM2100 uh, spacecraft, which it is the evolution of uh, RCA's uh, uh, platform from the mid 70s. And uh, we call uh, it is LM2100 because it is 21st century's platform, three axis stabilized. It is very capable it can go up to 18, 20 kilowatt payload power. So you can put a lot of payload uh, uh, hardware on this uh, spacecraft. It has uh, the uh, flexible solar arrays, which uh, uh, also the International Space uh, Station, ISS, is using this flexible uh, solar arrays. They are very light and uh, they're deployed in space, they're not hard. So it brings a lot of weight uh, uh, advantage uh, to uh, the, the platform. And uh, because of the size, uh, you can put a lot of uh, antennas on the, the uh, antenna panel uh, to communicate with the, uh, with the, with the ground stations. And uh, uh, I am sure you must have heard that intelligent payloads, intelligent spacecrafts, that means uh, that uh, in space you can program this uh, uh, coverage of these antennas, which Lockheed Martin invests a lot of effort and funds to come up with the, uh, we call ESA, electronically steerable arrays. In the recent past, up to recent past, some of the satellites that most of the satellites i must say we have launched it has a, a fixed coverage area so after you launch for the uh, 15 or 15 plus uh, uh, space life or service life you cannot change the coverage area but thanks to the engineers uh, i think most of the companies uh, implemented that uh, technique now that uh, you can electronically steer the certain parts of the antenna uh, to uh, redirect your your transmitted signal. So that allows you to cope with the market changes. So um, so you don't have to have a fix, but then you can adapt based on your your uh, uh, marketing uh, efforts and, and market change, which is. Uh, very, very uh, good feature to have. Uh, next uh, chart, please. Uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. Uh, 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 Lockheed Martin was the, the first uh, designer uh, and manufacturer contractor of the global positioning system, GPS. Uh, and recently, uh, they have received the uh, third generation GPS uh, spacecraft. Uh, I think uh, we use uh, uh, GPS. Before Galileo, there was GPS. There is still GPS, and I think it's complementary, and I think it is used uh, around the world. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, 
early warning uh, early warning uh, is very very important uh, as uh, mr morin uh, also during his presentation explained uh, one of the space uh, uh, used areas is to give us the warning for example when a, a, an adversary uh, country uh, launches a, a missile from the thermal properties change this spacecraft sensors can detect the temperature uh, dynamically being changed and and uh, also uh, determines where that is uh, so that you can take the precautions and uh, 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 it's called uh, Sibers uh, system and it provides US government and also the allied forces uh, a very uh, uh, good, great support for uh, missile defense area. And I hope this uh, would not be experienced, but uh, uh, I'm afraid to say the conflicts uh, never ends in our world. Always there are uh, some conflicts. Uh, so we, we look at this early warning uh, capabilities is a great protection to uh, free world, Western world and, and our allies. Uh, next chart, please. Weather forecasting also is very, very important. Uh, it's uh, Lockheed Martin uh, Space Company has manufactured a lot of uh, weather uh, uh, sensored satellites and uh, uh, provides uh, uh, advanced weather information to, uh, you can imagine, uh, anybody needs the weather forecast that uh, these satellites uh, can provide a good and precise data and over the years the uh, the uh, weather instruments are uh, improved of course and we are very thankful to our subcontractors or or designers and manufacturers of those sensors giving us uh, the best sensors that we can uh, uh, we can uh, integrate and and and, and launch uh, next chart please Yes, uh, human exploration, uh, as I indicated before, uh, we uh, are heavily involved with the, the uh, space science uh, and uh, space exploration. Uh, I think we have a great uh, collaboration with, not only with NASA, uh, but also with all the, uh, like, if I name it, like European Space Agency and all the uh, uh, national space agencies. I think it is very clear that uh, human space exploration or uh, deep space exploration, it is really not uh, possible to manage by one nation. And, and, and we need uh, the international collaboration. And uh, uh, I believe human exploration collaboration, uh, the way I see this, is a great, uh, uh, great uh, feature, great thing that uh, nations can uh, put together their capabilities and and go forward together. It unites us all human beings. Uh, uh, Lockheed Martin is the prime contractor for Orion uh, vehicle. Orion will serve uh, for human exploration. Uh, it is about to be uh, completing all its uh, uh, functional and acceptance tests. And uh, I believe, uh, I don't want to give exact time, but in a very short uh, span of time, in, in, in a year or year and a half, uh, we'll uh, put uh, astronauts, human beings on uh, in Orion to be launched by uh, SLS, Space Launch Systems. Uh, for uh, a tryout mission. And then the plan is to uh, bring the humans to moon, hopefully uh, in 2023, 2024 timeframe. And then uh, I think the next big thing would be is take the humans to, uh, to Mars. I, I hope that uh, one day it'll happen, uh, but I think uh, we'll see this happening uh, sometime, uh, maybe between 2030 and 2040. Uh, 
I don't know if my lifetime would uh, allow me to see that, but uh, I'm sure lots of young uh, uh, participants to this uh, meeting, to this call, I, hopefully you will see those uh, with, your, with your eyes. Next chart, please. Um, yes. Um, uh, also, uh, there are there are studies that uh, that we are uh, uh, doing uh, robotic deep space exploration orbiters and landers for Mars and uh, asteroids for uh, scientific researchers and then uh, how can we utilize those uh, asteroids. Uh, that uh, is another uh, area that uh, our engineers are 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 working. Um, uh, one thing uh, uh, Mr. Morin uh, indicated and also uh, Mr. Lukasek uh, showed us during uh, her presentation, uh, we have to be uh, uh, we have to be a little bit concerned about the uh, especially the uh, the space debris, uh, especially in the low Earth orbit. And there are some studies uh, I, I don't remember the numbers now, but uh, there are thousands and thousands of objects uh, circulating the orbit, and uh, uh, we have to find some mechanisms to to clean uh, the so-called space junk, especially from the low Earth orbit. And uh, we are also looking forward uh, how to uh, come up with certain capabilities to clean, especially the Leo low Earth orbit, from uh, the unused or the the items that they they are utilized and they don't uh, serve anymore so uh, uh, the way i look at it from a little bit humanistic look you know just i, I think we harm so much earth uh, and we realize this uh, that we have to work differently we have to live differently we have to treat our earth much better than how we used to uh, uh, as a person who is involved with space, uh, I always invite uh, the key decision makers or uh, us manufacturers and operators uh, to, to use space wisely. Uh, let's do not uh, do the same what we have done to Earth, to space. We have to treat space and we have to protect space. Uh, next chart, please. Um, I think I uh, indicated uh, we have a group called Mission Solutions, uh, which uh, I think without their work, uh, all what we have done and launched would be meaningless. Uh, we have to receive the data from those uh, uh, to to receive from those platforms that we launched and and sent to space, but we have to uh, we have to process them. Uh, I think it is a very important step. It's like, I think this group is like, a, a, you can buy a very expensive uh, high fidelity system to your home to listen music. But if you don't have good speakers, uh, all those good things, good hardware that you put together, it's it's not going to show uh, the performance, real performance. So uh, mission mission solutions is the I, I say is the speaker of the high fidelity chain of a home stereo system. Uh, the next chart, please. I think uh, uh, that is the end. Uh, one question came. Uh, to direct it to Lockheed Martin. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask the moderator, should I treat that now or uh, should we wait uh, the, the question and answer session? We can wait for the, for the Q&A session. Well, thank you very much uh, for your patience uh, uh, and uh, I'll be standby. Thank you as well. Uh, so it's been a very informative session thank you to all now there are quite a lot of questions we have some questions which have been asked in advance from some of the bulgarian policymakers which are in the field and i'll start uh, with this and then we'll open the floor for some of the questions from the chats and all the social media channels so i'll start with a question to uh, dr morin 
uh, and the question is uh, based on your experience could you share some good examples of uh, the space industry working with uh, industry from from other fields and what good uh, successful business models have been uh, visible and that you know of Dr. Morin, I know if you're online. Thank you. I did not have control of my own mute button. I'm afraid you had it. Oh. <laughs> the uh, no, it's quite all right. Um, so this is a very interesting question today. The history of space. We talk a lot about spin-off technologies. Uh, technologies developed particularly for the initial uh, U.S.-Soviet space race that were then adopted in broader civilian sectors. Uh, there is still some of that in some important uh, areas where that's occurring, but the applications of space now directly to Earth tend to be much more focused on data applications versus uh, direct technology applications and the technology flow is going in many senses the other way. Um, a lot of what, for example, our colleagues at Planet have been able to do is founded on miniaturization of electronic components that was driven, I think, predominantly by the consumer electronic industry and the cell phones and industry. That allowed them to get to smaller form factors for many of the uh, subcomponents that make up their satellites and, and all the others that are working in the uh, CubeSat form factors. So this is, a, this is something to keep in mind. There are many opportunities to pull uh, advanced technology from other domains and apply it in space and then there are enormous opportunities to take space-based data and apply it to solve fundamental human problems. So we had, as we had with the discussion earlier about the sustainable development goals, uh, I've been part of a number of uh, hackathons and other events uh, as, a, as a judge where groups are working to develop applications of space data for fundamental human problems. So I would think of it in those terms and there's a huge uh, set of allied industries, right? Uh, optical components is an area of excitement. Uh, radar and electronics, uh, signal processing. These are areas where um, there's a diverse pool of players around the world in these industries. Some of them have very substantial potential space applications in some cases off the shelf or in other cases with modest investments in uh, perhaps hardening or um, making them a little more robust. So an, an exciting area for exploration. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is uh, for Mazut uh, and Lockheed Martin. So the question is, as an innovative company, how do you build partnerships with startups? and other smaller uh, technological companies? And also, how do you build relationships with the academia and universities? Uh, OK, uh, thank you. Uh, well, the control button, it doesn't respond very quickly. Uh, well, uh, uh, there are a number of things uh, that we employ. One is, uh, like, uh, I am uh, European and Middle East uh, a business development and sales person. Uh, in my region, in my area, uh, one of my tasks is to uh, also uh, establish the dialogue with this uh, startups, be aware of them, be aware of their capabilities and see where can we collaborate? Uh, first, uh, it starts with knowing them, uh, knowing uh, their interest areas and capabilities, and how can we uh, how can we work with them, determine the areas, uh, and uh, 
for the areas that we find interesting and uh, which would serve to our uh, goals, number of goals, then uh, we can fund those studies. Uh, we share the IP, uh, intellectual property. So that's one thing. Uh, uh, I think it is the first uh, interaction with you and your organization. Uh, you, if you please provide my name and my credentials, my contact information, I will uh, welcome uh, all this uh, coming towards me uh, and then start my dialogue. That's that's one thing. Uh, also, uh, with universities, we in U.S. in particular, we have uh, 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 very, very good interactions. Uh, we have a uh, number of studies supporting the uh, Master uh, of Science students or PhD students, the thesis. Uh, and also we, uh, we can give, uh, we can name the study, we can define what we want uh, as, a, as a outcome result, outcoming results. And then we fund those studies in the universities. In that regard, uh, uh, please, uh, I apologize for my ignorance. Uh, I've never been to Bulgaria. Uh, I don't know well uh, Bulgarian capabilities or academical uh, acad academia, academical circles. Uh, but uh, our Lockheed Martin International person who is in charge of uh, Bulgaria also, Kostas Papadopoulos, uh, he and I, we spoke. And thank you for your initiative. It started the, the, the dialogue on this with Kostas. And uh, I would be delighted to come and to interact with uh, uh, Bulgarian academical circles. And uh, uh, there is also like one a very good program that we can discuss, uh, which uh, there is a, a institute called Lockheed Martin uh, funds and supports its Milo Institute. There are a number of space explorations projects that Milo uh, is, is uh, thinking to implement. And uh, also we can have uh, Bulgarian academical circles to uh, get uh, you know, a play in this uh, project. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, welcome all the um, connections to me. And uh, after this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's kind of eased further and we can be allowed to start the international travel uh, I will be delighted to come and uh, uh, start our dialogue with the uh, startups and uh, academical circles. Thank you very much for your readiness. Just to give you some background, we've got many professionals and uh, scientists in this field. In the technical universities in Bulgaria, also there's a whole defense un military university which works uh, directly with the Ministry of uh, defense. So I'm very sure there is much uh, potential for, for collaboration, but we can talk this later on once the um, webinar is ready. Now the next question is for Agnieszka and it is, uh, could you please share with us some examples of uh, partnership of planet with uh, government bodies? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, so it's 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 uh, most of the time it's a really a business relationship. It's it's I'm not sure I would call it really a partnership per se. Um, so we work with a lot of governments uh, in international organizations like the EU or ESA or UN um, in um, certain initiatives or projects where um, the governments are proc procuring our data for various uh, purposes. So. For instance, on the EU level, as I've mentioned in my in my presentation, it's um, the procurement mostly happens through the Copernicus program, and then that data is available to to member states and citizens really worldwide. Um, through ESA, the same thing through the Earth third party mission, EarthNet program, and um, and then we have collaboration with various governments on. Um, and it would of course love to do something with Bulgaria. We haven't had an opportunity yet, but uh, but I'm sure there are, there are many many things that we could do together. Okay, wonderful. 
And now uh, we have, as, as I mentioned, we've got quite a few questions from uh, people from our institutions. And once we're ready with the live webinar, we're going to have like a very short 10 minute discussion in which they'll be able to share their, uh, their questions directly. But before this, I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions from our, our viewers online. And the first one is, uh, in what ways do navigation satellites increase productivity in agriculture? And if you could give any specific examples. So that's a question that pretty much any one of you could answer. Probably, I don't know if... Yeah, I can jump in here. Thank you for the Thanks. unmute. Uh, the So... The biggest areas of application of uh, space technology for uh, agriculture come from being very uh, precise in how farmers apply things like uh, pesticides and fertilizers and seed to their land. So if you know with precision um, the layout of the land, which is uh, geo uh, geospatial data. You know the condition of the soil, which you can do with both uh, in situ sensors as well as uh, space monitoring uh, or aerial monitoring. And you, um, and you know the condition of the crops, many attributes of which can be viewed even with fairly um, unsophisticated space sensors. Uh, you're able to make more uh, precise application of all of those other inputs, which makes them uh, makes fields more productive and um, can reduce costs for farmers. One of the key technologies that underpins that is a ability to integrate that those multiple sources of data into a precision agriculture plan which is then typically implemented by a tractor. Uh, so a, a, a farmer driving a tractor that is being steered based on global positioning data uh, in his, own, his or her own field and um, with a computer system that is saying to the, fact, to the tractor and say it's uh, um, seed spreading uh, attachment, that it's so or that uh, you know these are the places to apply your seeds heavily and here are the places to apply it lightly based on the uh, yield so that's uh, that's common today in industrial scale agriculture in the united states uh, in parts of europe and uh, parts of south america and asia um, it's increasingly common in other parts of the world it, it does depend a lot on the nature of the crops that are being grown and uh, uh, the degree to which these kinds of uh, treatments have been developed and uh, uh, made as precise as possible. But it, it really is space technology being applied right down to the individual uh, farmer. Thank you very much. And the last question before we close officially, I guess it's from uh, a young enthusiast who would like to find a job in the aerospace industry. And it is for um, Agnieszka and it is, how did you find yourself working for Planet and what excites you most about the company? And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add to this question, if I or someone else from our viewers would like to uh, find a job in such a company, what we should do? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very cool story, really, because I, um, so first of all, I was working before, uh, before Planet, I was working in the European Commission on the Copernicus program. And um, so I've been doing space and, um, uh, and Earth observation for a while. But even going back uh, but before that, I actually, I don't know if we have m many of uh, young people students and young professionals on this at this conference but uh i was engaged heavily engaged with an organization called um space generation advisory council um sgc and uh, i was actually a, a first executive director of that organization and then became a chair and when i was the executive director of that organization um it's will marshall who's the ceo of planet was the chair so we know each other way 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 before even planet existed 
And that organization uh, is really amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's working worldwide. It has representatives really, I mean, everywhere in the world. Uh, I know it has representatives in Bulgaria as well. And it's really a great network to be part of because you meet people really from all over the world. And many alums from that organization are um, ended up ending up in very uh, cool or high places. So, um, so this was a really big trampoline for me, and 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 I have been, you know, I'm still very much attached to what I call my space family. Um, and uh, it's 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 been great. So fast forward, you know, I I, I left SGC. Uh, by the way, to be a member of SGC, you need to be between 18 and 35 years old. Um, so Kevin, you cannot join, but uh, but I'm sure somebody working from you can. <laughs> um, so uh, this uh, this after that, you know, I was working for for. Uh, at the European Space Policy Institute, and then I worked for Secure World Foundation, um, in uh, which is a, a foundation dealing with space security and sustainability issues. And then I went to the Commission. And um, after a few years in the Commission, I, um, you know, I was in touch with the founders of Planet because I, I've known them, and they're like, we're expanding in Europe, and you are in Europe, and you know us, and you know. You know, U.S. works in your, you know, Europe. Uh, why don't you come join us? So it was just kind of like I didn't. It just kind of happened, you know. Uh, but um, but my advice would be so. First of all, there are a couple of things. First of all, we are hiring all the time. So check our website, planet.com. We are also one of uh, very few companies, I think, that is hiring people uh, worldwide, regardless if you have the right visa or paperwork. If we think you're valuable, if you think you are a um, strong candidate, we are going to go out of our way and get you the right papers. Um, so it's uh, it's really an opportunity. I don't know, unfortunately, if we have any Bulgarians working for us now, uh, but um, I know we're actually interviewing a Bulgarian now, now when I think about it, but, uh, but maybe there are others that are working there as well. So if you are, you know, you can look at our jobs, our jobs are in uh, either in San Francisco or in Berlin, or really we have also remote uh, positions. So I am based, for instance, in Brussels, and we have people in all kinds of different uh, places. Uh, so yeah, so so you are always you always feel free to apply, but to get this sort of a job in general, I mean, you need to be active, you know, in um in a, in a sector. So I always recommend getting involved in, in organizations like like SGC if you're a young professional, or Women in Aerospace, or you know IF. Um, just you know, have an, that will give you opportunity to meet people and get a good network and you know maybe publish uh, papers and um, um, yeah just 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 try to be proactive. It's I know it's not easy, but it is it is possible. You know I'm originally from Poland. I come from a small Polish uh, town in the mountains and high Tatras and. You know, I never really thought this is what I would be doing. So um, don't think that just because you are, you know, um, I don't know, based in Bulgaria or somewhere else, that you're uh, you have no you have no opportunities. You do. You just need to be um, confident in yourself. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to let Carmen officially close uh, our session. So I have also some questions which uh, was uh, uh, put into the registration form. One of them, I think, is uh, very important because it is from our representative in the Bulgarian embassy in the European Union. Mrs. Ileana Tanasova asked it, what is the advice of panelists for the best ways to encourage economical growth and maximize the benefit from space policy and programs? I hope some of the panelists, also Agnieszka, who is with her big experience in the European Union, maybe, or Mr. or Dr. Morin. Oh, uh, they, they can't hear you? Yes. Agnieszka, do you hear? No, no, hear okay. no, it's okay. Because somebody is muting us. And uh, when I, we're trying to speak, we cannot unmute ourselves. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So a couple of things. I work, you know, I work with the, I'm, I'm in Brussels for reasons. So I work a lot with the EU institutions and, and other, and, and governments in, in general. And this is a very good question because it is extremely important to link um, space technology to the economic growth. And particularly in Europe, I know that there is a big, big push for that. So uh, you have to demonstrate that this 
um, what we're doing in space is actually not only worthwhile and interesting, um, but it's also actually translating into economical growth. And um, and there are several ways. First of all, you know, you have this entire downstream economy. So I can obviously speak on a on a um, uh, use planet as an example, but I'm sure other speakers have, have their own examples. But you know, we we produce. First of all, we're creating jobs. We're paying taxes. We're creating jobs. We're innovating. Um, so we're bringing innovation um, and to Europe or US or wherever we are. But also there's this whole downstream um, economy that is benefiting because there are other companies and there are taking our data, you know, software companies, pro IT companies, uh, companies specializing in um, different sectors from agri agriculture to, to mining to uh, energy, et cetera, that can use that data and make their business better. So it is a trickling down effect, you know, that, that space sector is really, I find space sector extremely horizontal. It's not, it, it's not really vertical in a sense. It's vertical because things are going up, but in, in the way it, it, it impacts the world, it's very horizontal. So it impacts may, very different areas um, of the economy and of life. And I think we need to create more awareness and do a better user uptake to let people know that they can actually use these tools. Right, that there is that they can use um, uh, GNSS or Earth observation or telecom um, for everyday um, activities, and I think many people, uh, in ge generally speaking, are not aware of this. We're not very good at doing PR. We're very good talking to ourselves. Uh, we're not very good talking to the external world, and I think we need to get a little bit better at that. Because when I tell people, you know, that I work, uh, for instance, friends or. I meet somebody and they're like, oh, what do you do? And I say, oh, I work for a space company. They're like, oh, you know, are you going, are you going to Mars or have you met an alien? And, you know, this is what they think about space. And it's, they do not understand the kind of pragmatic usage of it. So I think also the governments um, should really help uh, with that, you know. So when, uh, for instance, they, they do engage with, with the space uh, um, activity, that they really do a lot of, um, uh, kind of a, uh, capacity building and, 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 and also awareness raising activities that go so, so that space technology used specifically for, I don't know, deforestation, um, disaster management, agriculture, uh, monitoring of, of uh, pipes uh, uh, and whatnot, you know. So this is, this is really a, a, a topic in which we need to engage together, I think. That's, uh, I think, a really strong answer and some excellent examples there. I would, I would just add a couple thoughts. Um, first, in the COVID-19 environment, we've realized that there are real costs to uh, monitoring things from Earth, right? the, the travel uh, that people have to do to gather data, the uh, visiting with other human beings, there's risks and hence cost associated with that. In many cases, things that we can do through space um, have alternatives on Earth, but those aren't free either. Right? Instead of sending a telecommunications signal over a satellite, you can send it over a fiber optic cable, but that cable has to be laid and put in place and maintained. Uh, instead of gathering climate data with a weather satellite, you can build weather stations on the earth, at least in some places. There's some data that it can only be gathered from orbit. There are these alternatives, but I think in the COVID environment, we're realizing in many cases, the expense and risk associated with that grows. Many of the cases that Planet um, talks about publicly are cases where the cost of getting information comes because others are seeking to hide that information. The deforestation case or uh, civil repression, you know, in places where uh, for a journalist to make their way there and take photographs uh, involves real risk. So I, I encourage people thinking about applications of space. Think about where it is very efficient. Think about where it is safer. Think about where it will let you collect data that is otherwise unavailable because you don't have the right perspective or position to get it. And 
think about those cases where the sort of fundamentally global nature of the problem uh, is best solved with a fundamentally global sort of solution, which is what you typically have in space. The geometries of orbits mean that you are rarely going to be collecting data or moving uh, electromagnetic radiation in ways that are um, purely within the jurisdiction of one nation. It, it reaches at global scale. And so those are the kinds of problems that we can best apply uh, space technology to. And I think we are have a growing appreciation of the importance of those in today's environment. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, there is also uh, a couple of questions from the Dr. Velizak Shalomanov, Deputy Director of Institutes of Information and Communication Technology, and also Chairman of Supervisory Board of NATO Communication Information Agency. Uh, first of this is how to coordinate the various elements to create integrated catalog of the service based on space technology. And second, how is the cybersecurity of this service guaranteed? This is one of the questions, two questions. I personally had a little trouble understanding the first question. The second one was source of cybersecurity for this. How is the, how is the cybersecurity of this service guaranteed? This is second question. And how to coordinate the various element to create an integrated catalog of service based on space technology. Okay, how to have an integrated catalog of uh, space-based yes. services, yeah. So, there, the when we say services provided on, from space-based technology, that's a, an extraordinarily broad question. I typically, in trying to think through the services space-based technology provides, divide it into moving data from one place to another, telecommunications, gathering data, uh, broadly earth observation, and broadcasting information that others can use for their own applications. Most The most famous example in that category is uh, GNSS positioning, right? Where essentially you have satellites saying with great precision, right now the time is x and uh your your device is receiving that and triangulating from that to calculate your precise position so you're you're moving data from one place to another you're broadcasting data that others can apply or you are creating data by observing the earth in some way shape or form so that gives you kind of broad categories of space-based service the catalog beneath each of those is growing more complicated every year. Uh, to give you an example, um, there's a great deal of energy and excitement right now surrounding the ability to very precisely measure the um, delays and bending of the signals from the GPS satellites and other GNSS satellites in order to make observations about the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, it's referred to as GPS radio occultation. And with very precise receivers, you can actually draw pretty sophisticated conclusions about what's going on in the atmosphere based on how that um, those timing signals get to a specific point, either in orbit or in some cases on the ground. That is um, a completely new service that you know, until just a handful of years ago, uh, the computing processing power and sensors to to deal with it didn't exist. So that that list of services keeps expanding. Um, and it's to to create that sort of catalog that the questioner is asking about, you've got to be very much uh, aware of developments in multiple technical fields. The other service that's emerging and is I think a critical challenge uh, going forward because we are getting more dependent on space and we are doing more things in space is making sense of what is actually happening in space. 
So the space traffic management problem or space domain awareness or space situational awareness problem, those are all interrelated and mean slightly different things. The, uh, that it becomes an enabling service for all of the other services. Thanks. Uh, maybe I, also I, I'd like to add uh, a few yes. words on this. Uh, I think, okay, uh, we're not a service uh, provider company. We are constructing company. We are uh, we are manufacturing, but I think uh, maybe we shouldn't expect one to come up with this uh, list of catalog. I think uh, there are a number of uh, operators and providers providing service in different areas, different fields uh, of space. And I think uh, those companies, either they don't do a good job uh, or uh, they're not available. But I, I am sure, for example, let's take one operator, Utilsat. If one goes to Utilsat uh, and approaches them, they come up with a, the, a lot of uh, good things that Utilsat is doing. Uh, there are so many different service providers. So uh, the originator of this question, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, is it is uh, is a, a kind of a one kind of uh, catalog is uh, expected or one organization to put? That is almost impossible. I think uh, they have to contact and get this information from the service providers, which there are many. Yeah, it makes total sense. Common, any other questions? Hold on. There's some internal communication on whether we should uh, Just uh, a second, Katya will try to unmute all microphone of uh, the, the, now we have opportunity, do you hear me? No, we're also muted. I, I think we're, all of us are muted yes. right yes. now. Yes. Uh, do we hear each other? Because I'm afraid we're all muted right now. Like, for example, I don't think you hear us and neither do we hear you. Come and do you hear me? No. No, well, I'm afraid there is a technical issue right now. Do you hear now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. There, there was a technical it's issue it's and we were, all of us are muted and now we hope all of us are unmuted. Is there any question from the participant in the Zoom meeting? Maybe from our friends from the uh, American Bulgarian Chamber? Hello, everyone. Uh, we have Alice. no further questions. Yeah. I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Morin, for his participation and his input. It is very, it's uh, very valuable, you know, as a country. And also to the rest of the speakers, I think, Agnieszka, uh, your presentation was amazing. And uh, Mr. Chicharek, yours oh. as well. So uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful discussion today. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think this is a wonderful ending of our session today. We'd also like to thank everyone, especially the speakers. Uh, personally for us, it has been a very valuable discussion and we really hope that we'll be able to continue offline with the next steps. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all of the speakers. I can ask the presenters to stay a few minutes in the Zoom. We will stop now the uh, streamline translation to YouTube. Thank you. In a few minutes if you can. Okay, can. Thank you. Okay, we can stop now.